Uh, welcome to this special webinar on the U.S. election, the state of play. What we want to do is just present the data on the election that will occur in less than two weeks. And uh, our intent in doing this is for you to uh, understand why we are seeing what we are seeing as the election unfolds. So we have some slides we want to share with you. And uh, let's get to it. These graphs are the, uh, the polling, the latest polling data on the race. As you can see at the top, this is the national head-to-head, -head, Harris versus Trump. It's uh, 49-48, one point, well within the margin of error. Um, it does show Trump uh, gaining, having a little tilt upwards uh, mm -hmm. at this stage of the campaign, consolidating his vote. But it is um, so close, and this is why everyone says it's too close to call. Now, we know the election is not decided, of course, on the popular vote, but by the Electoral College. We'll get to the Electoral College a little bit later. About 41, 42 states consistently vote one way or the other. In this election, there are seven states that are truly open. They flip back and forth over the past three elections. There are three in the north, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, the industrial blue wall states. Two in the Sun Belt, Arizona and Nevada. And two in the south, North Carolina and Georgia. And as you can see, the uh, Trump-Harris uh, polling in, the, in those states track what's happening nationally. One's up a point, the other's down a point, uh, with no clear break at this stage in the race. So they are also effectively tied uh, less than two weeks to, the, uh, to election day. We can see in July the kind of massive energy that Harris injected into the Democratic ticket. But as you said, Bruce, as it stands, it's currently essentially a dead heat. We have Harris and Trump within the margin of error. Um, obviously, the 2016 election was decided by around 79,000 votes in a few key swing states. In 2020, it was even less. It was only 44,000. Um, and we've had pollsters in recent weeks saying that this election could be even closer and could be one of the closest elections we've seen in decades. So all the modeling indicates that essentially at this stage, the race is a toss up. And I'd say the only thing I'll add to that is that obviously we've been watching the polls very closely this whole time. Um, and because it's so tight and because they've so many of them have been within the margin of error for so long, I'm really interested in the trends. If we see things that are really consistently happening, that's when I feel a little bit more confident in it. And I think the fact that the trend we're seeing across a lot of polls is that Trump is performing a bit stronger now than he was, even Bruce, when you sent around the charts a few days before this and then the updated chart, he Trump had tightened the gap in a lot of these uh, swing states that had changed. So I'd say that trend shows that Trump is performing better than he was even a couple of weeks ago. And also, I mean, something that sticks out to me is in both the 2016 and the 2020 election, Trump performed better uh, in the actual election than he did in the polling leading up to it. I don't feel like the polling has changed that radically, um, that it's going to be so much more accurate than in the past. So I will say that things are looking better for Trump right now than they were just two weeks ago. Uh, now we're going to show the favorables, unfavorables for the two candidates. This is uh, Donald Trump and where he is. As you can see, his unfavorables over 50 percent. He has never cracked 50 percent approval throughout his presidency or in his campaigns. And this suggests that he has a ceiling below 50%. He's about 45, 46, 47, but he never commands support from a majority of the country. I think this graph also captures uh, character issues, trust issues, leadership issues, and whether or not um, uh, people want him to return to the presidency at this time. And that provides an opportunity for Harris to consolidate her base, rebuild the Biden coalition that won in 2020, and uh, beat Trump uh, at the, uh, on election day. Yeah, I would say, um, echoing you said, Bruce, um, Trump has a low floor and a high ceiling, but in recent months, he has been able to grow the number of, um, when it comes to favorability, just by a couple percentage points, which could be decisive. Um, I think compared to Harris at this point, most Americans know Trump. He has served a term as US president. He has run, this is his third time running um, for the presidency. And I think that's part of why we haven't seen um, particularly dramatic shifts in his favorability and unfavorability ratings this election cycle. This is Kamala Harris, her favorable, unfavorable. Uh, a couple things here. Um, her polling tracks President Biden because of course she was by, is vice president, they work together. And so it's a proxy for Biden's support across the country. On the far left of the graph where the lines cross into unfavorable territory for her, that's Afghanistan. And shortly, which was a debacle, frankly. And shortly after Afghanistan, inflation kicked off. 
Biden never got above 50 percent after that point. And, and Harris was dog with it until Biden steps aside and she enters the race and consolidates the party. And then you see on the right hand side of the graph, she leaps 17 points to become almost even. Uh, she's not underwater like Trump. And it, uh, the only other time that this has happened in such a short period is uh, 2001, 9-11. George, the country rallies to George W. Bush as it faces one of its greatest foreign policy crises. So this is where Harris, the favorability shows that uh, she can attract, she, she can have growth in her, um, in her appeal and growth in voters, unlike Trump, who really just has the ceiling that he's been dealing with. I think, yeah, as you said, Bruce, we saw Harris really energize a Democratic base when she entered the race and a massive spike in her favorability ratings. But this was mostly driven by shifts among Democrats and independents. Um, and so now she's essentially hit a ceiling. I think what's interesting with Harris is that she had quite a low profile as vice president. And we continued to see polling where voters were saying if they um, learned more information about her, they'd be open to changing their mind about Harris, which wasn't necessarily true. Um, for Trump. So I think that's why we've been able to see a lot of movement from her in recent months as she's kind of gaining ground among, among some of those Democrats and independents who weren't necessarily as familiar with her um, before she became the Democratic nominee. Great. Mari, any thoughts? Yeah, the one thing I'll say is uh, that jump in favorability for Kamala Harris also indicates the tremendous momentum and energy that she brought, which is critical in a U.S. election. So much of this election is going to come down to voter turnout. So I think that's one of her strongest assets going into the final leg of the campaign. If that momentum stays high, uh, hopefully that means her supporters will get out and vote. Another important thing that really will determine how people vote is the mood of the country, the direction of the country. And this is a classic uh, political science polling question. Is America moving in, in the right direction or in the wrong track? And what this shows is that people are really pessimistic about where the country is headed. And this is a signal that this is a change election. And then the question is, well, what kind of change is it? Now, normally, if you had not, not had a transition, if Biden was still running, the change election would be against him because the, uh, the country is not in a happy place. But with Harris coming in, and as Mari said, quick acceleration into a favorable status, Part of the change might be, well, we want to change from the Trump-Biden years and to have a younger leader, more vigorous, who's committed more, obviously, to trying to bring the country together. So Harris might be able to have a piece of this pessimism, frankly, about mm -hmm. the future of the country as it stands right now. Yeah, I would also add that I think um, this sentiment and sort of some of this negative attitude towards the future direction of the country is um, quite pronounced among young people in particular. Um, it's showing up in other polls that say that young people are quite disillusioned by the current state of America. I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, we have around 8 million estimates of 8 million Gen Z Americans who are aging into the electorate and will be eligible to vote for the first time. I think I'll be watching to see if this sort of attitude and pessimism translates into feeling disillusioned and not turning out or inspires young people to kind of show up and turn out on election day. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. We're going to go to get into some issues. We're now going to move to issues driving the election. They are inflation, immigration, and abortion rights. We're going to start with inflation. What this graph shows is what's happened to prices since Joe Biden was elected and in office. And it shows that inflation in a basket of goods that everyone uses every week has gone up between 10 and 40 percent. This is, it, it, this is why Biden is so unpopular as a sitting president. The president owns the economy in the United States and the prime minister owns the economy here. And if we had a chart of Australian inflation and high interest rates, it would look like this. And uh, the prime minister's polling looks like Joe Biden's polling. So uh, we also know just historically, people vote the economy first as the most important factor in their decision as to who they want to lead the country. So this is a significant territory, political territory and election territory for the country. Yeah, I would just add that I think we know that the economic mood in the country continues to be really low. All the data shows that. And that unlike issues like democracy or questions about Gen 6, which might be more abstract, um, cost of living pressures really directly impact the lives of Americans every single day. And I think that's why we know that that, that will continue to be um, the strongest issue on Election Day that is driving voters, but also one that Trump continues to lead Harris on by quite high margins. I agree with all that. I looked up the Australian numbers. They are very similar. But I think the Trump card with this is that, uh, yes, the jobs have done well, or a lot of the economic figures in terms of the economy broadly are great. 
but people think about it every time they go to the grocery store and they're paying more and for the things they normally buy or they're paying more for rent. So that is always going to be front of mind, regardless of what the job numbers say. And so I think that's why this issue is so salient for so many American voters. The next slide really has to do, this is a classic question. In 1980, Ronald Reagan asked Jimmy Carter uh, in, their, in their presidential debate, well, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And it became a touchstone. That line is now used in, in Australian political debates between the leaders going into an election. And as you can see, the 2024 que answer to the question is, well, no, only 38, 39% of Americans believe that they're better off than four years ago. I'd also take you on that question in 1992. Uh, George H.W. Bush was president at the time. The country was in a recession. And, uh, you know, 40, 46 percent 50, and 52 percent today say, no, we're worse off. And uh, Bill Clinton won that election. So this shows the vulnerability, actually, of Harris uh, as working with Biden on the state of the economy. And it does give Trump uh, some political firepower, as he as he says, bring me back to the White House. The second big issue we want to discuss is immigration into the United States. And this is a graph that shows uh, a border that has not been under control for some time. And, uh, and uh, Donald Trump is exceptionally skilled at pushing the immigration button. It was uh, the, the issue that he signaled first when he declared his presidency in 2015 in Trump Tower, that Mexicans were pouring over the border. Uh, they were rapists. They had to be stopped. He was going to build a wall. Mexico was going to pay for it. And he has used immigration consistently ever since. He always returns to it at all of his rallies and just makes the he sees it as really core to all, to all of his domestic programs and international programs. So this shows that uh, the border has not been stabilized. And again, it's a drag on Kamala Harris uh, as she faces uh, American voters. I think a massive part of this, as you alluded to, Bruce, is that um, Harris is trying to position herself as a change candidate, but she is a sitting vice president. And I think on immigration in particular, one of the main challenges she faces is being tied to Biden's record on the border. This is something we've seen Republicans really tried to lean into by positioning her as the border czar. And we do have polling that sort of suggests that some of this messaging is working when it comes to voters, really seeing her as responsible, at least in part, um, for lots of the issues we're seeing with immigration at the moment. So I think that's really a challenge that she is having to contend with when it comes to the issue of immigration in particular. Yeah, so this is a chart that Trump loves and he loves to use. He brought it up at the Republican National Convention and news outlets love to fact check it and point out that there are some things that are inaccurate about the chart. Like he's got the date for when he leaves office, that's in the wrong place. And some other things are maybe mislabeled. But what the fact checking doesn't usually analyze is the fact that the overall trend he's talking about is accurate. You can see that that increase in immigration is clear under the Biden administration. It has been much, much higher. And I think he's performed really strong when he can e emphasize that and show that trend broadly. Abortion rights is the third big issue. It affects tens of millions of American women and then their friends, their families and associates. And of course, uh, we're in a situation where the Supreme Court repealed the protections of Roe v. Wade, a constitutional right to reproductive health services, and to, uh, sent it back to the states. Each state can determine what the laws will be. What we've seen over the past two years is that even in Republican-dominated states, such as Kansas, Ohio, and Indiana, citizens have put this issue on the ballot, should our state laws protect abortion rights, and voters have voted in those states, and they've enacted a, a legislation that lifts restrictions on reproductive health services. So in November, these are the states that will have that issue on the ballot. And uh, we'd like you to take note that two swing states, Nevada and Arizona, uh, will be voting on it. Now, this could increase uh, turnout by women uh, in the election and uh, expressing theirs. I, I'm, my sense is that, in fact, these measures will pass in those states and there may be some crossover effect uh, on the presidential vote, if you vote for abortion rights, you're going to vote for the former president who put justices on the Supreme Court that took those rights away. 
Yeah, this is obviously the first presidential election since Roe v. Wade was overturned in, two, in 2022. And I think since then, we've seen abortion become an incredibly volatile electoral issue um, and been especially powerful at galvanizing women in America to turn out to vote. Um, obviously, in 2022, after the Dobbs decision, we saw a massive surge in women who were registering to vote in the 2022 midterms. Um, and lots of reports suggested that abortion was a key reason why, why Democrats were able to stave off a red wave in those elections and even gain a seat in the Senate. Um, I think this election cycle, as the first election presidential election since Roe v. Wade was overturned, it'll be really interesting to see how this plays into the result and what it means for um, voters in these 10 states where abortion is literally on the ballot and where when you're voting for president, this issue will be forced to be front of mind when you're making that decision. So now the question is, we have the issues, we have the drivers, and now the question is, who is seen as best to manage these issues and be a better president on them. And I think on the two most important issues, the two most important tangible issues, uh, inflation and the economy and immigration, you can see that uh, uh, Donald Trump has a commanding lead in confidence as to what he's going to do. So again, I think this is a further boost that he has with those issues going into this election. I always think about the question, was it James Carville who came up with, it's the economy, stupid? <laughs> that was very formative for me. And I wonder, you know, is it's the economy stupid? Is, is this still true? If so, that does uh, mean a lot for Trump. We just talked about how important the economy is to voters this election. So out of those three issues that we talked about, if they trust Trump more on economy and immigration, that's a very commanding position for him to be in. And so all of this uh, gets distilled. Uh, the issues, how they're managed, the uh, mood of the country, favorable, unfavorable, they ultimately get distilled into the Electoral College because voters vote, they vote in their states. And the Electoral College is composed of, for each state, the number of electoral votes they have is composed of uh, the two senators that they have and then the number of members of the House of Representatives and their delegation to Congress. So North Dakota, up at the top in red next to Minnesota, has two senators and one member of the House, three electoral votes. California on the left has two senators and 52 uh, members of the House, so 54 electoral votes, each state so assigned. And the total number of electoral votes is 538. And a majority of 538 is 270. So again, as we mentioned, historical voting patterns, the Democrats go into the election with about 226 electoral votes from those states in blue, shades of blue. The Republicans have 219. So both short of 270 at this stage. And then you have the seven swing states in yellow. And you can play electoral math uh, till the cows come home on November 5th. But what you see is various combinations of states will give you the electoral majority. And a lot of people have focused on Pennsylvania as being the key state. Why? If Pennsylvania, if, if Kamala Harris say, carries Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which are the three states that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016 and uh, was defeated for the presidency, but which Joe Biden recaptured in 2020 and became president. If Harris does that, those three states add up to 270 electoral votes. As far as Donald Trump is concerned, if he carries Pennsylvania and then carries North Carolina and Georgia, he reaches 270 electoral votes. So that's why Pennsylvania is really a compelling uh, state in the electoral count. And then if, if, let's say, Harris loses a state like Michigan, well, she can play with the other states like Georgia, for example, or North Carolina to make up for that loss. So it is a it is a complicated, very fluid situation among those states. Another indication of just how close this election could be. So um, Pennsylvania is the swing state that is the biggest electoral prize with 19 electoral college votes. Um, and it's hard to imagine either Trump or Harris losing Pennsylvania and still being able to go on and win the election. Yeah. And one thing I'll add is that Pennsylvania is one of the slowest uh, states in terms of completing the absentee ballot count. Um, and so it's the biggest prize and it's going to take longer than most of the other swing states to be able to complete the tally. So places like uh, the Associated Press won't be able to call the um, election probably until the Pennsylvania results come in, if it's really, really close. If Trump is ahead in a majority of the swing states, they'll probably call it that way and vice versa for Harris. Uh, but if it's really razor thin, they're going to wait till Pennsylvania comes in. And then last year, that happened four days after the election. And that's when they called the race for Biden at that stage. And that's when all the legal challenges began. <laughs>
So to conclude our presentation, just some final thoughts on what on the data that we've seen. If um, if Harris loses this election, I think because of what Mari and Ava said as well, if there's a lack of confidence in her ability to manage the economy, and the economy is really hurting households, if she loses the election, I think it's going to be because of the economy and people being insecure about the future. If Trump loses the if 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 Trump um, if Trump loses the election, his unpopularity and the future of American democracy means that there's not a vote of confidence in his ability to come back to the White House. And I think that's going to be the balance and the interplay of factors between these two candidates in the final days. I think that's exactly right. It's about if voters choose to um, turn out to support issues like abortion and concerns over democracy or whether we do see those cost of living inflation economy concerns that we discussed really triumph and be front of mind on election day. I agree that this race really will come down to voter turnout. And on those big issues, which of those issues are motivating versus which are depressing, which are actually going to rile people up so they go to the effort of going to the polls versus which ones might make them unhappy with the result but not motivated enough to turn up and vote. And I think the real pulse check on what those issues people care most about will be told in the story we see on elections. I think it's a great summation for, uh, from, from you as well. And uh, thanks for joining us.